Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? First item regards Alabama. Alabama is like Florida's little brother. Not quite as bad in most cases. This year they are experiencing what are described as super nests again. Giant wasp hives that can be the size of a small car. The hives are populated by a particular species of wasp called a yellow jacket. Each of these super hives can hold four times the regular number of workers. That's about 15,000 wasps. That alone is a problem, as these hives, they've come out a month earlier than they have the last time such a plague-like proportion of wasps occurred. This gives the wasps the opportunity to expand their colony for longer, and the unfortunate news is that unlike regular hives, these ones, due to their size, are able to survive over winter. The best advice when approaching a super hive is not to approach it. The yellow jacket is an aggressive species of wasp. They will attempt to attack anyone that they believe to be a threat to their hive, and wasps are the asshole of the universe as far as stinging insects go, as when they sting, they keep stinging. They do not lose their stinger like a bee would, and as a consequence, one is bad enough, but a hive with thousands? That is going to be very unpleasant. Remaining in the general area of nature, researchers studying plants believe that they can now clearly and absolutely say that plants do not have the necessary capacity or need for mental functions. There's been an ongoing debate about whether or not plants can think and feel, and these researchers believe that they can categorically state that a plant does not have the absolute minimum of neurological structures required for consciousness. The problem with this conclusion is that there is some evidence that plants can be trained to behave in certain ways, not in the terms of the cutting, pruning and wiring and bonsai, but rather, but to elicit a specific biological response to a stimulus. Whether this is simply understanding and exploiting specific and already existing biological processes within the plant is something that is up for debate and needs to be further pieced out in other research. But the conclusion as far as basic neurological functions are concerned is solid. It's based on work by Feinberg and Malat. They were exploring when and how primary consciousness could have occurred in evolutionary terms. They found that there were anatomical thresholds for a degree of complexity that the brain needed before consciousness could evolve. And this is the important distinction between plants' ability to communicate and interact with other plants and trained or biological responses to specific stimuli. There is an argument that Claiming plants have sensation and consciousness is necessary to maintain ecological diversity and to protect the environment, particularly looking at global warming as an example. Spain has had an example of why we should be concerned about global warming, when a hay pile spontaneously ignited, as has been repeatedly noted in the news recently. Spain and Europe as a whole has been experiencing an unusually high heat wave. As has been reported, this has led to a number of fires, the largest of which has occurred recently, and is directly tied into a large manure pile that had been fermenting. While these fires are not on the level of California, it is still 200 square kilometers of land that has been burnt out because of a manure pile. This one fire leading to 200 square kilometers of destruction is just one of 400 that have started in the past two days, going now from the environment to a very, very small subset of science, connectomics, which is the study of the nervous system of organisms. As you may know, 
Understanding the structure of the neurological system of any animal is very difficult. And so, scientists have been looking at ever smaller organisms in an attempt to understand neurobiology. In this instance, yeast and bacteria are simply too small and do not have a nervous system. Something like a mouse is too big and far too complex. Researchers have chosen to use a species called Tana habitus elendens, which is a roundworm. Roundworms are not, by any stretch of the imagination, a novel species. In fact, the roundworm is a common species to use in research. While other studies have mapped the nervous system of the roundworm species, these researchers have gone even further by not just mapping it, but mapping every single connection in this nervous system, both in the male and the female of the species. To give some context, yeast are made up of a single cell, sometimes connected, sometimes not. Mice are made up of millions and millions and millions. This roundworm species is made up of about a thousand cells, and they're only about a millimetre in size. And what will likely be a horrible finding to those who are ultra-progressive, the hermaphroditic version has 302 neurons, whereas the male of the species has 385. Significant differences mainly attributable to sex. Moving slightly away from anatomy and into biology, scientists believe that they have found a viable CRISPR method to resolve HIV in mice. Unlike Dr. He in China and the CRISPR babies, this has used a proper model of the disease and a proper way to test the idea. As you may understand, HIV is very hard to remove. It not only infects tissues, but it also infects one of the main immunological cells responsible for its removal. This newest method is called laser art which is an acronym for Sequential Long Acting Slow Effective Release Antiviral Therapy and is coupled with the CRISPR techniques. This works to effectively remove the viral gene from cells as per standard antiretroviral therapies. The CRISPR method adds an inhibitor to the multiplication of the cells and works to remove the DNA fragments responsible for the multiplication of the HIV virus. The success of this study should be tempered with the fact that it only achieved success in 30% of the animals. This is a far higher success rate than antiretroviral therapies alone have, which is almost 0%. The work is both in animals at this stage and at very early stages in the investigation. This means long term, the success rate may increase drastically, or it may be found that it has significant off-target effects that have not been detected at this stage. It does, however, indicate that there is substantial evidence that CRISPR could provide a viable avenue of treatment for an otherwise untreatable condition Going now from studies of HIV and mouse models, an analysis of the sedentary behaviour of video gamers and body mass has found evidence to support the argument for neckbeards. As astounding as the revelation is, the researchers have found that sitting down to play video games more frequently results in a higher body mass index. The caveat to this is that the association is found for adults not for children or adolescents. The meta-analysis is built on 20 studies that had just over 38,000 participants. Before dividing each of the age groups, the whole study showed less than 1% variance between the groups that were active and those that were not. After subdividing the various groups, they found that there was little evidence that gaming would displace physical activity. In other words, playing video games and being fat were not related unless you are an adult, and even then, the link is relatively small. 
this undermines, or at least does not support, the idea of fedora wearing neckbeards. Looking at health in general, one study recently believes that oranges, grapes, and carrots contain cancer fighting compounds that are closely related to, if not resemble, licensed drugs. As you may know, bioprospecting is not an uncommon practice. It is the process of exploring naturally occurring products, such as food, and seeing if there are molecules with a useful biological function. In this case, a study analyzed 7,900 molecules found within fruits and vegetables. They believe 110 of these could be very similar to drugs used to fight cancer. The researchers from Imperial College London believe that they could one day work towards creating a diet that would be food as medicine, allowing people to consume the right foods with the right particular compounds to provide them with better health. The problem with this is that the research has yet to be published, and if it has not yet been published, peer reviewers get to work on it, and as a result, there may be substantial flaws in the claims being made. However, there is reason to think that to a degree, there is a viable underlying reason to it. It's currently estimated that nearly half of all cancers could be avoided through good diet. What has been reviewed and is very well understood is antibiotics cannot help you with the flu. Influenza is a virus. Antibiotics are for bacteria. The two do not work together at all. However, there is some evidence that antibiotics may actually make the flu worse. Antibiotics are generally not specific in where they target. They are a body-wide functioning medication, and as a result, you will often find that when taking antibiotics, the microbiome of your digestive tract is essentially destroyed. This then leads to your immune system having less material to train with. Less training for your immune system leads to less ability to resist the flu. Investigators from the Francis Crick Institute found this by investigating how the immune response ramps up to the flu virus. Their initial investigation worked on something called interferon signaling. They found that using antibiotics for between two and four weeks led to not only a greater increase in the immunological response because the body took longer to mount it, but that the amount of virus multiplication within the lung was significantly higher. This led to two things. One, the amount of the virus was five times higher. This leads to more damage, as the way a virus gets out of a cell is by lysing that cell. If the immune response is also higher, it leads to more damage and more symptoms as more cells are destroyed or having the virus in them. This speculation is very interesting, and the evidence that supports it is also interesting, but they then had to find a way to verify it. This was done using mice that, yet again, had a fecal transplant done on them. The mice were either treated with antibiotics then given a fecal transplant to repopulate their microbiome. They were not given the fecal transplant, or they were not given antibiotics. What was found was that those who had received a transplant, or had not been given antibiotics, had an increase in the interferon signal. This was directly associated with an improved resistance to the flu, going from the visceral to space. The long cigar-shaped asteroid known as Oumuamua, was for a time thought to be a possible alien probe. Researchers now believe that they have satisfactory evidence to clearly say it is simply an interstellar object. While this may disappoint the more excited members of the public, it is more consistent with what we know of the natural world and space in general. In other space-related news, 
SpaceX has lost contact with three of the satellites they have been using to provide internet access. In the first of what will likely be many launches, SpaceX launched 60 satellites in May. This is part of a program they have called Starlink. The project aims to put thousands of satellites into orbit that will then provide high-speed internet. Of the remaining 57 satellites, 45 have reached their final destinations. In a fine example of marketing, the spokesperson for SpaceX has described the failed satellites as passively deorbiting, which for anyone else would be falling back to Earth. This first batch of satellites is considered experimental in nature. The fact they've already lost three and anticipate losing another two does not come as a surprise to SpaceX. In fact, another two are being deliberately destroyed to prove that they can be removed from space's junk. Speaking of junk, Facebook is attempting to remove more of the alternative crowd than they have in the past. Although this is a form of censorship, there is some legitimacy to what they are doing and how they are doing it. Rather than just censoring or suppressing these groups, they are taking a simple approach of viewing them as spam. These are groups that can have hundreds of thousands of members that reiterate and repeat fables about the value of baking soda or apple cider vinegar and more harsh things like giving bleach to children with autism. By viewing these posts as a form of spam, Facebook's algorithm will downrank them which means that they will have less reach and be less likely to find their way to a new audience. It's unlikely Facebook will be able to bring reason to those who already actively practice these things, but by reducing the ability to spread misinformation, there is a chance that they may be able to at least limit its effect. This activity will also apply to Facebook groups that advocate for natural treatments. Facebook will attempt to downrank these as well. This will then lead to their own internal members receiving notifications less frequently. The algorithm is using keywords and phrases that are associated with these sorts of posts, particularly those that exaggerate false health claims. This action, along with other similar actions by Facebook and other social media platforms, are a good step towards healthy practices. However, this must also be countered by the fact that they will actively, and without concern, sell ad space and targeted ads to the same sorts of groups. Speaking of scams and fake news, there is a game being put out by researchers that could help to mitigate some of the effect of fake news and sensational news. The game works as a training tool to allow people to understand how an online presence could be working and what they're doing to work in an effort to make a certain position more pronounced or palatable. It is something of a role-playing game where you take on the persona of a fake news or conspiracy theory or alternative facts practitioner. The game is based on the idea of being a social media simulator you build a platform, an audience, and content that you then share. Sharing it successfully leads to an increase in audience size. Sharing it unsuccessfully leads to a decrease in audience size in response to perceived or expected kickback. The researchers have stated that none of the methods or actions within the game are new and anyone who has been on the internet would be familiar with them. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions below.